sifter.com.au. Hello and welcome to Lightmap from SIFTA. On Lightmap, we have conversations and explore the culture of games and interactive media. We meet game makers, journalists, and thinkers from around the world. My name is Gianni. Thank you so much for joining me. I guess this week is Sam Barlow, one of the creatives at Half Mermaid, whose games, her story, telling lies, and immortality, blur the lines between cinema and interactivity. And it's a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much, Sam. Thanks for having me. I've seen a lot of interviews, I've seen a lot of descriptions of who you are and what you do, but in your own words, who is Sam Barlow and what does Sam Barlow do? Wow. Uh, <laughs> you put me on the spot there. Um, uh, Sam Barlow is uh, a very personable and, and charming human being who, uh, yeah, I, who tries not to get too hung up on words and definitions, which is hard in making things that sometimes, you know, sit in different categories. But uh, I would, I would probably describe myself uh, primarily as a, a games maker and uh, one who's really interested in bringing a lot of the unique aspects that make video games interesting and figuring out ways of applying them directly to storytelling in ways that, um, you know, are somewhat unusual. Is it a, a challenge to describe what you do when everyone wants a very short elevator pitch? You need to be able to say it's a bit like this that does this. Um, is that something you've come into conflict with trying to describe your work? I've, well, I've, I've realized that part, part of, the, of being good at my job if I, if I want to be good at my job, part of that is coming up with something which is easy to explain. Um, and, and obviously, if you make a, you know, a cover-based first-person shooter set in space, then you can just say that. Uh, so it was really obvious when I made her story that despite that being very different to the games I've made prior to that, it did do a good job of explaining itself. If you, if you showed people a, a short clip from it and you said, this is a video game where you're in a police database... Uh, trying to figure out if this woman murdered her husband. People were like, okay, I get it. I get what my role is. I'm kind of a detective. I get the objective. I kind of get what the interface is going to be and the, what the constraints of the gameplay are going to be because I've seen those moments in TV shows where someone is, you know, it's uh, two-thirds of the way through the story and they've hit a dead end and it's 3 a.m. and they're just looking through the police database until they see that that little clue. And so with that, I was like, okay, I, it, it's something that is not a standard video game, but to a games person or to a non-games person, like I can kind of concisely sell them on this thing. And I know that when I made Telling Lies, it wasn't as easy because I made the mistake of creating a story that in like the first hour of the gameplay you would kind of discover what the story was about right and, and you would spend that first hour having all sorts of fun just trying to figure out what the hell is is going on here and we would test it on people who came in knowing nothing and they all had a fantastic time and you know the fact that in that first hour they suddenly went oh that's what this is was cool for them so we were like well that's really cool so we, we should safeguard that when we released the game. So then we realized like we couldn't give them the pitch that was as concise as has this woman murdered her husband. And we couldn't even really be specific about the genre other than saying, you know, it's kind of a thriller. There are some, you know, intimate relationships between adults. Um, so then when we just made Immortality, I was like, okay, let's make sure this is a very easy thing to explain to people. And then you just go, well, there was an actress who filmed these three movies. None of them ever came out. She disappeared. What happened to her? Okay, people get that now. They get the hook. They can imagine in their head, missing actress. Oh, that's very, you know, mysterious and sexy and lynchy and what have you. Um, and then, you know, you would show them some of the, the elements of the interface. And they'd be like, oh, I can see how that is going to be cool, right? I think there's 
a trick to making someone told me the trick to making a good puzzle game is is if you show someone a screenshot they should be able to kind of play the game in their head right and, and similarly here it's like if you show someone a little bit of the game they can start in their head imagining oh this is really cool oh well in immortality i can click on anything on the screen and it will generate a match cut and they can start imagining the cool scenarios that that might kind of lead to so that's that's kind of my thing is to not fixate on explaining the bigger picture which is what i struggle to do when you just on the spot ask me to talk about what i do right is, is yeah if i try and describe the bigger picture of what it is i do then it gets tricky right i can't just say i'm a civil engineer i build bridges um but you know with with the games themselves it's like oh there's something really chunky there if the game kind of explains itself which i think is you know true of most things I'm interesting, interested in the point you made about, you know, a, a cover-based third-person shooter in space has a certain visual identity. You know, you can kind of know what basically you're going to get. But your games don't look like that. They are filmed on sets with actors and, you know, are what were, were described in the 90s as FMV games um, to an extent. Um, t- talk to me about that relationship between um, using footage and constructed, you know, um, film to build an interactive story when you're trying to tell people that it's a video game the interesting thing is when you you look at what happened in the 90s where they they kind of had this moment where before 3d technology took hold just slightly ahead of it was like cd-rom video technology which like you say it was, it was called fmv because for the first time ever there was full motion video because prior to that you couldn't get enough frames on screen so it, there was no motion um and and, and like that was a, a thing that I wasn't super into at the time. Um, I kind of I don't think I had a CD-ROM drive, so I couldn't play those games. But it always looked kind of cool. Um, but it, it it died a death because 3D was was way cooler, and a lot of the games that people made with that technology were uh, generally bad. Um, and they struggled with figuring out how to use that technology in the format of a traditional video game of like, uh, you know, intense skill-based real-time things in terms of like huge amounts of systemic agency. Um, and, and in the genres that had been popularized in video games that you know often did focus on action and adventure and science fiction and fantasy, live action is really expensive and complicated. Um, but interestingly, if you look back, there was an explosion within that, limited kind of FMV window uh, of genres that you didn't see before or after. Like suddenly there were legal, legal video games. There were, you know, kind of, um, you know, lawyer thrillers and uh, erotic thrillers and psychological, really twisted psychological horror things and romance. And just suddenly all of these genres, which no one had really tried to make a game of or been able to make a game of before, as soon as you got like a level of human performance on camera, it enabled a lot of these stories, which are more kind of character focused. So that, um, you know, was quite interesting to me. But certainly when I started doing this, I'd come from, uh, I'd done three years directing a, a big, expensive AAA game that got cancelled. We'd done like a year of performance capture on that. And so I was slightly defeated by the, the sheer effort involved in motion capture to just try and communicate the, the simplest or purest human expressions. It was, it was so laborious. Um, but I knew I wanted to keep telling stories and I was trying to figure out like, how do I, as an indie dev, like how am I gonna tell character-based stories if I can't have characters on screen? Cause they cost millions of dollars. Uh, and, and you know, all this motion capture and all this high-end photo reel rendering and I, I didn't want to go for the compromise that um, was was becoming a thing back then, which was, you know, you can, if you can tell a story that conveniently involves everybody having disappeared five minutes before the story begins, you can go to town, right? So you can do Gone Home or you can do Dear Esther or Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Uh, all these games that were like figuring out what is the reason that everybody disappeared. Uh, and, you know, you can do that once or twice or three times, um, but that as a template wasn't really exciting for me. And so her story kind of came out of spending a lot of time thinking about 
making something in the police procedural space, which was this idea of, oh, this is a genre that's very popular everywhere else, hasn't really been nailed in video games. We've tried, you know, Phoenix Wright, L.A. Noir. There have been these attempts. And, you know, interestingly, L.A. Noir was, was an example of them going, the only way this genre will work is if we have those incredible character performances being captured. The issue was they, they did, what essentially they did was they did photographically film people's heads and then dropped them onto video game characters' bodies and then put that in the midst of a world that had to have car chases and shootouts and all the kind of GTA stuff. So there was, there was a lot of dissonance there. Um, but yeah, I, I thought a lot about how to make a detective game. And I did, I did a lot of research into well, what, what happens if, if a detective has a suspect in an interview room, how do we, what is the technique? I kind of read up on all the training manual manuals and all the academic research into that moment. I watched all the movies with interesting interrogations in them. And I discovered at that point, we were just kind of on the cusp of the true crime explosion. And, and as well, at the same time, the kind of ubiquity of video, like YouTube had become a huge thing. Everyone now had phones that could film video, record video, play video. And so part of my research was realizing that there were all, the, all this footage online of real life police interrogations. And kind of watching that, I was like, this is so um, like, you know, not always in a, uh, uh, very virtuous way. Like it's slightly kind of vicarious or voyeuristic, like so interesting to watch. And obviously that we, we saw them with cereal and making a murder and everything blowing up that that was true for the entire population. Um, and, and really like absorbing all this video whilst thinking about the process, understanding the methodology of the homicide detective, which is very word-based like the homicide detectives will listen out for particular tenses pronouns particular you know did they use names there's all these little verbal ticks that will give people's lies away and so kind of all that stewed together and then one day i literally just woke up and was like why don't i make a game where you act the videos is the thing right that make a game about that and and i could have the the you know the database is the interface and then i'm using kind of text and natural language like all my favorite old text games but the constraint of that scenario is such that it doesn't have to be this all singing and dancing kind of super intelligent parser like people will get how the constraints work so it kind of came out of that and then once i'd done that then i started to think about it more seriously in terms of what am i doing why is this interesting and and really latched onto this idea of exploring video in the same way that you might explore space in a normal game. So all the things I love about Nintendo games, about the way Mario moves and jumps through an environment, the simplicity of that with uh, the way Zelda or Metroid, the worlds open up and become more, more complex and explorable. It was like, well, how does that apply to a massive video? Like how can I create ways for the player to explore the video that are expressive, that are challenging, that you know have these kind of exploratory layers to them? Um, and yeah, that's been a, a fun ride. Can you tell me a little bit about how you plot out a story like her story or immortality? What does it look like in the production and as you're planning out all the different linking pieces? The key thing is to not try too hard to link the pieces. So um, I don't think anyone's got a, an official term for what these things are, but I know sometimes people bandy around like a database story, which I think existed previously there's, there's some kind of experimental artists on early computers doing stuff like this um and that's really the key is to create a very large story that you know spills off the pages of what would normally be the pages and and, and have a format to store all of that in and then the gameplay is what are the ways in which i can interact with this database um and that and the key to that is then letting people interact in such a way that they can create meaning and make connections. And some of that is in, in plotting out the story, which is, is all, has always essentially been a giant, giant spreadsheet. Um, being able to look at any little piece and the, it's, it's like a very simple test usually is, are there several things happening at once in this small piece? 
So it's a little it's a little bit like the thing with holograms, right? Where any piece of a hologram contains the information for the whole rest of the hologram, or is that DNA? I don't know. It's one of those clever science things. So that you know, if we if we have one little scene in these games. It, it has to do everything. It has to be like, well, what's happening in the A plot? Uh, what's happening in the character on screen's story? Um, what pieces of visual imagery or thematic imagery are in there? Uh, is there some other conceit like uh, in Immortality? Do we want to see a little bit of business around how films are made? A little kind of you know piece of craft about filmmaking in there. And you look at each scene and make sure it has one of all of these things in it. So then... When players come in and they're going in completely different directions, right? One person is obsessing over, I'm really interested in the story of this character, uh, Carl Greenwood. And so they are able to see the elements of this scene which speak to his story and the relationship he's having with with the actress off camera and the role he's playing on screen. And they can, in, in the gameplay of Immortality, click on Carl's face and jump to another scene in which Carl appears. And so they're now creating the story of Carl from these little jigsaw pieces. And if each of those scenes does have some useful piece of what's going on with Carl, they can create a meaningful story where other people might come in and, oh, they're really interested in the story of the movie Carl's in. And so they're following a completely different thread and they might click on, uh, you know, if they click on the camera assistant from that movie, they're going to automatically jump into another scene with that camera system. So you really trying to create something that's so densely packed and rich that it it works in all those directions which is again i always relate this back to like playing the new, the latest zelda games it, it i feel like a kinship with them cuz i mean obviously they it's it's you know slight amount of hubris to compare myself with those and they're also on a different very different scale but the premise of those games is you can walk in any direction if you see anything in the distance that you think looks interesting, go there and it will be interesting. And whatever you do, it will feel fun and it will feel like an adventure. And the moment to moment will be rich and fascinating and full of texture and, and beautiful. And it's a similar pitch to players on my games. It's look, immerse yourself in this giant mush of stuff, this huge pile of content that you're in the middle of and follow a thread that's interesting to yourself. And it will become meaningful and whatever happens along the way you're going to see some really interesting stuff um you know and the moment to moment of it is going to be pleasant we're not you know this is not a game that punishes you at any point which i think is also key because i think on on one hand if you say to players you have all this freedom no direction we're not going to tell you what to do or how to make sense of it that can as well as being exciting be kind of scary and create anxiety so to compensate for that we say well we're never going to give you a game over we're never going to tell you you did it wrong, right? You, if you just keep playing, you're going to see cool stuff. It's fine, right? Whereas there are some games, um, you know, similarly opaque games like Dark Souls, but that's different. That's a game that says, if you don't get it, you're going to die and you just have to keep trying again. If you don't understand the story and the lore, tough. I mean, you can go and look on, you know, a, a website and see what other people have told you. But, you know, that's that's a more, you know, I think that's, that's a more acquired taste because it does ask a lot of you whereas we try and be generous it's interesting that you bring up zelda because with that and playing immortality i really felt getting sidetracked and pulled off in other direction was the point almost um can you tell me a little bit about how you know the visual language of games and the contrast that we ha- need for interactivity in particular H- how did you apply that to film because i felt that i was often really drawn visually to certain elements to, to click on. Um, and almost certainly that was always a thing I could click on. But can you tell me, did, in terms of making that as, you know, as filming that, what did you have to do? Was there anything that didn't work or, or anything you had to change as you were, you know, blocking all out? The, the only thing we really did, because we had, with, with all of these games, the planning before we go to the shoot is always extremely thorough. And we'll have versions of the thing that we can test, whether it's purely textual or we've shot some test footage um, we did for Telling Lies. Um, so when we get to set, usually it's like this, the script is, is pretty fixed. Um, in the case of something like her story or telling lies, you cannot change a word of the script, right? Otherwise you break the flow. In the case of immortality, it was like, well, uh, the testing we did, uh, assumed from the script that these certain things would be on screen. 
Um, and, you know, some of those are obvious, like, well, clearly this character who's talking is going to be on camera. Oh, and this prop that he's holding up is going to be on camera. So we we had stuff that was like, well, this has to be on screen and we should not go out of a way to hide it, right? If, if the character has a dagger and the game has assumed there's going to be a dagger on this screen, let's make sure it's actually on camera. And then all the other stuff that shows up on set is is kind of a bonus and the only thing was there were points where, uh, and like te- technically, um, it, and the crew wasn't union. So you know, you're usually the director's not allowed to interfere with the props, right? That is the job of the prop department. And if the director goes out, he gets told off. Um, but sometimes I would run out, we'd see things in camera. We'd usually, we'd figure out a lot of the framing on the day with the actors and block it out. So the actors usually on my things, uh, we are very strict about certain elements, right? Like this is the script. Oh, this is the content of the scene. This is the context of the scene. But then in terms of the blocking and trying to help them create something more interesting and, and have the director of photography come in and figure out how's, how do we make this look great? That tends to be quite exploratory. But then, you know, looking at it in camera, it'd be like, oh, there's a lot of clutter in this scene. Like we have to remove some of these things because you don't want to give people too much kind of false noise. And every now and then, you know, the art department would go to town, especially like the art studio in, in the second movie, just putting all this stuff everywhere. And you'd be like, oh, man, that looks like this thing looks super interesting. You can keep that in there, but let's just move it forward a bit. But let's lose. Yeah, but let's lose these other three little bits and pieces of stuff that's just kind of cluttering. So, you know, there was a little bit of, of, of you know, cleaning things up visually. But otherwise... Um, you know, it was it was really just about capturing everything we were intending to capture, and then um, you know having yeah, there's so many so many things going on at once that you're just like we, you know, that you you tend to get naturally quite a lot of kind of focus and clarity just from all the different pieces that you're trying to kind of pull together in a scene. I'm curious when you're thinking about players, because I've often seen this complaint from game developers before that people who play games in, in these days really only play games. They don't have the sort of broad understanding of different types of media and a game like immortality i feel really relies on a bit of an understanding if you don't need to be a complete film buff but you need to kind of understand a bit of the process and a bit of the history uh, of filmmaking um is that a challenge for you or or are the people you're targeting you know who they are and they're going to get what you make yeah i mean there was an element of with immortality like the trick being by presenting this as a game and, and giving you these certain uh, actions you can take, I want to trick you into being as much of a cinephile as me, right? Like in the real world, I might watch a movie and then go and read the biography of the director and read about all the behind the scenes mishaps, right? Or I might uh, watch some making or documentary, or I might watch three movies by the same director in a weekend, right? And see the connective tissue between them all. Or watch, uh, I love supercut videos online, right? Where it's like, here are all the shots of teapots from every one of Ozu's movies or all the eyes from it and staircases from Hitchcock movies. So it was like, this is, you know, because you, if you tell people this is a game and you have an objective and you're in control, suddenly they are slowing the footage down and paying attention and obsessing over little details and noticing the connective tissue between three movies with the same people involved and stuff. And, and you know, you, you kind of trick them into being as obsessive, which I think is... I think all all the games I've made are about putting people into a slightly obsessive mindset, which is very rewarding, right? Um, but it's hard in this day and age where we're inundated with so much stuff to have that level of focus and obsessiveness. Uh, I did, uh, I remember being very amused, I did this one-off interactive uh, pilot TV thing uh, that was uh, a, a reboot of the movie War Games, it was like it was essentially an interactive online TV show thing, and they did focus tests, and it was aimed at quite a young teen audience. So they brought all these kids in and had them kind of watch and interact with the episode. And the the comment I remember most was this one kid at the end of it, like in the, the you know the the debrief, put his hand up and was like, "This was so cool. Normally when I watch TV, I'm doing two or three things at once." I'll be looking at my phone, the TV on the background, I'll be doing something else. But because this was interactive, I had to concentrate 
And it's so rewarding when you concentrate on a story. So I was like, oh, shit, like that's, I mean, it's cool that that worked, but it was interesting that that was his perspective on things. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's I'm increasingly becoming a grumpy old man just because it does seem like the world is getting worse for a second. You know, we have a lot more like, you know, when I see my, my kids and the technology they have access to, and, you know, when I grew up, I never even thought of being a games maker because it seemed like the technology and the hardware and the education you would need to make a video game was something that was kind of outside of my reach. And as, as suddenly, like when I was a teenager, I was obsessed with film and with art and the effort to see certain movies, like you just couldn't, right? They, if they weren't on the two TV channels we had, uh, and they weren't on video or I had, and I would have to go somewhere and pay money to get them on video. It was like such an effort to discover films, uh, especially the more obscure ones. Whereas now they are mostly at our fingertips and we have all this access to them. So I think on one hand, you have an audience that is distracted and, you know, is just inundated with all sorts of evil things. Um, but they are also, you know, they do have the stuff at their fingertips. They do have all this, this material. So, it isn't too hard for them to become like, you know, super educated. Like I, there was an interview with um, Brian De Palma and he was talking about, it was one of his movies, maybe it was Body Double. It was like one of his very Hitchcockian ones. And he was talking about how it was inspired by Vertigo, but he hadn't seen Vertigo for years when he wrote it. He was like, oh, they, they, there, was a, there was like a reissue of Vertigo that was in film theaters in L.A. And I saw it and I saw it with like William Friedkin or someone. And then we talked about it afterwards. And then a year later, I was writing this script based on my memories of what Vertigo was like. And it was crazy to think that this movie that clearly is playing homage was done in such a way because he, he couldn't just click a button. Right. If I now want to pay homage to Hitchcock, I can press a button, I can see every frame of every movie and kind of dig into it all. So, um, you know, it's definitely, and I, when I'm trying to be positive about the state of things, I'm like, well, you know, this is a generation that is learning how to deal with information overload and that will become their superpower. Um, and then I waste an hour on TikTok and <laughs> it just suddenly changed my mind. Well, you change that one person's life who's put their hand up and realize that you should concentrate on one screen at a time. I'm really curious. Uh, at the moment, there's a lot of talk uh, in in Hollywood. Uh, the Writers Guild of America, Screen Actors Guild, are currently striking for conditions. And one of the things that strikes me uh, about this is, particularly from the screen actors, is they're concerned about performance capture and the reuse of performance. That's something that happens in video games, half a course. That's something that happens all the time. Um, where do you think you land and, and what do you worry about for the future of the people who are acting in your games? Is, is it a concern for you? Yeah, I'm definitely with them in that, you know, even when I was doing motion capture, like for me, the only way, it's not the only way, but certainly the best way for me to tell a story is to have actors on hand because as a, as a writer director, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give the player the tools to do something interesting. And then as a writer, I'm trying to create this very dense, rich world um, for them to extract things from, right? And I particularly, I'm interested in stories where things are in the subtext, where things do have to be extracted and drawn out by the player. And the amazing, this amazing tool for doing that is, is the actor, right? If you spend all this time thinking of all the research planning this giant spreadsheet of stuff and this entire world that you're then squeezing down into some lines of dialogue with subtext and some actions on screen. Actors are just incredible at taking that, reabsorbing all of the information and then kind of uncompressing it for the audience beautifully. So, you know, for me, uh, it's hard to imagine skipping that step because I think that's how you get things which are more genuine and authentic. Um, and I think, you know, even where we're doing motion capture, the, the state of the art in motion capture is how can we get closer to the human being, right? How can we get what sh shows up in the game to be as fantastic as what we saw on the stage, which was always the challenge for me in, in kind of 2000s technology was I'd look at the 
the video that we captured on the day and be like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. I'm so moved. This is an incredible performance. And then you'd see the version in the game engine and it, it, it didn't have that nuance, right? So the goal in, in the game side of things has always been how can we take all of that lovely humanity that the actors have, all of the subtlety and technique they have and get that on screen. And certainly the thing everyone's upset about is the use of AI, the use of likenesses in combination with AI so that, you know, if they've already done it, right? If you're a background actor in a Disney show, they've already scanned your face. And so the next show they shoot, when they need a bunch of background actors, maybe they can press a button and fill in some stuff. And they could argue it doesn't matter as much because they're background actors. And then, you know, there's a slippery slope. But at some point, you just have things which are less authentic. And like the bit that kills me with it is human beings aren't that expensive. And it's true of the writing, a lot of this with the art. Like before before generative art, no one was going, damn, there just aren't enough people creating paintings, right? Before generative text, people weren't going, there's not enough people writing books. Fact, there's probably too many people writing books, right? There's there is not a shortage. If I walk into a bookstore, I'm never like, crap, I used them all up. I read them all. Where's the new books? So they, it seem, we seem to be trying to use tech to solve problems that don't exist, right? Because we actors, there are more actors than can work, right? We we have this huge resource of actors to come in and you know bring characters to life. So it seems like you know there are there are useful things that this technology could help with, but the point where it replaces the, the human resource that is plentiful uh, just seems like that will lead us to more mediocre things. So, you know, I'm with them. Um, and, you know, it's not, I, I often see the, the counter argument of like, well, it's not really going to replace people, is it? Have you read an AI script? And that's kind of missing the point because clearly no one is going to want to go watch a movie written by an AI. But what it will allow the studios to do is go, we've already written half of it with an AI. You finish it off, we'll pay you half as much money, right? Or come in and do this acting work. We only need you for two days, not four days, um, because we're going to do some generative stuff. Oh, we don't need to call you back for reshoots because we can just reprogram your lips, right? These, these are the technologies where it, it just seems like it's not, it's not ever going to replace the human factor. It's just going to be a lever to pay people less money so that we can put more money in the pockets of uh, people who already have too much money. So, uh, yeah, I have uh, full solidarity with the struggle that's going on right now. I want my robots to be doing my housework, folding my laundry rather than making my art and my music. I think that's a pretty common refrain from a lot of people. Um, Sam Barlow, you'll be out uh, in Sydney um, for South by Southwest um, in the 15th, between the 15th and 22nd of October. That's when the festival runs. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on Lightmap. I feel like we could probably talk for hours more if we had the time but i appreciate you coming on the show thank you it's been fun yeah i could just keep going you'd have to tranquilize me at some point you can find links to everything we talked about on our website which is sifter.com.au read more about some of the other games and guests that we've featured on the lightmap podcast or on our other two podcasts walkthrough which is our news podcast or our new one drop rate which is reviews sifter is produced by fiona bartholomeus daniel ang adam christu chris button Mitch Lowe is our senior producer, and my name is Gianni Di Giovanni, and I'm the executive producer. While you're online, why not check out Sifter's Discord? You can find a great community of creative folk who are doing really cool things, um, sharing the stuff that they're making with us, game developers, artists, musicians, and more. That's at sifter.com.au forward slash Discord. That address, again, sifter.com.au forward slash Discord. And you probably hear podcasts ask this a fair bit. But if you can leave a rating and review on any of our three podcasts about what you liked about the show, it actually really does make a big difference. It does. It, it might sound like you hear that a lot, but it actually does make a big difference. So tell us what you think. Drop a review into any of our three podcasts, Lightmap, our interview show, Walkthrough, our news show, or Drop Rate, our review show. Just search for Sifter in your favorite podcast player and give us a, a rating, and that'll make a huge difference to people being able to find our work. That's all the time we have for this episode. Until next time, have fun.